I had prepared some stuff about two weeks ago and as I was just kind of processing with the Lord of like, what would be good for you guys? Not what do I want to teach and give away, but what actually do you guys need? And I was going to go through some stuff about Jesus' life and ministry. And one morning I kind of woke up and I really felt like um, this strong exhortation to teach you guys a theology of like leadership and shepherding and what it means to take care and pastor people. Uh, and I thought before I should do that, we should probably learn what it means to love people, like your neighbor, you know? So um, I actually just taught this at our house church like two weeks ago. So we're gonna kind of fly through um, loving God and neighbor. And then my goal is really to kind of get through that to set a precedent for the bad shepherds of Ezekiel 34 and the good shepherd of John 10. So today and tomorrow, we're gonna be mostly in this idea of shepherding and we're, we're gonna go deep, and if I go way beyond you, that's fine. Just I wanna give time tomorrow and some margin to just talk and ask questions and, and really just raw off the cuff questions about maybe leadership and pastoring and church and, or whatever you have. Maybe you wanna talk about the end times. I don't know. You just fire away. But are you guys good with that? Can we do that? All right. If, if I can kind of just set the tone for today and tomorrow, um, I do feel like a sobering, not correction, but a warning to you about leadership and shepherding and loving people well. Uh, Because the goal of the Christian life is not ministry. Uh, The goal of the Christian life isn't actually even leadership. The goal is faithfulness and obedience to, to Jesus. And in the process of being faithful to him, you are to steward others really well. Um, and we don't consume from others, we contribute towards others. And I think a lot of times our paradigm in the West is, well, Jesus loves me, you know, this I know, but I'm also gifted and I have a gift and I have things that I wanna give away. And, and I feel called to, to do certain things like lead and start a church. And, and all those things are great things, but they're byproducts of this main thing that is to love the Lord and to love others as yourself. You know, they asked Jesus, what's the most important thing about the whole Old Testament? If I'm honest, if a student or somebody at our house would just say, Joey, what do you think the most important thing of the Old Testament is? Not knowing already the answer, that probably would not have been my answer. It would have been like, just don't be idiots, you know, like don't sin or something like that. But for Jesus, it's, I want you to love me and to love your neighbor. That's the most important thing of the Christian life. So we'll get into this. So the golden rule, what is the golden rule? Does anybody know what the golden rule of life is? Do unto others as you would have done to yourself, right? That's Matthew 7, 12. Now I wanna read you something really, really quickly to you about this story from the first century BC. So late in the first century BC, there was a young Gentile who kind of trekked across the Mediterranean and his goal was to visit Israel in order to seek out like the greatest rabbis of the day, okay? Eventually, he came across two rabbis, Rabbi Shammai and Rabbi Hillel, which were the two most famous rabbis like in the first century BC. And he, he first came to Rabbi Shammai and he, and he said, Rabbi, I want you to teach me the entire Torah right as I stand on one foot. And you're thinking like, like if someone were to come to you and teach me the whole Old Testament while standing on one foot, you're like, my foot's gonna get really tired, <laughs> right? And Rabbi Shammai feeling belittled by him, picked up a two by four and hit him in the head with it. And the guy like kind of ran away. And so he goes off to the, to, the, to the next city and he finds Rabbi Hillel and he says the same thing. He says, while I stand on one foot, teach me the entire Torah, what does it mean? And Rabbi Hillel said, that which is hateful to you, don't do to others. That is the whole Torah. Everything else is just commentary. And when we're thinking about that, thinking like how, how often we get stuck in like, should we be eating pork? Should we be eating shellfish? Like, but, but this idea of like, hey, you know, stay away from idols, you know, don't do certain things, don't do this, don't do this, don't do this. And Jesus comes and says, the whole law is not about not doing something, it's actually about doing the right thing. Matthew 22, uh, Jesus gives this great commandment. He says this in, in verse 34 through 40. And again, I'm gonna kind of, this is just like the introduction for the actual teaching for today and tomorrow, this God and neighbor, okay? So if I go fast and you're like, I didn't catch that. I'll just send you my notes or whatever. Uh, Jesus says this in Matthew 22, 34. He says, but when the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. And he said, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, 
with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the entire law and the prophets. Now, thinking through this, we're gonna kind of dissect this a little bit. Jesus says, um, the second is like the first. So we have to ask, what's the first? Well, the first was the old commandment, which is love is required of you, okay? Uh, I don't know if you remember in Leviticus, but the Leviticus kind of like, I think it's chapter 19, talks about what it means to take care of other people, right? So if you have a field and you own a field, you're not allowed to reap from the corners of that field. And if while gathering, if stuff falls off your cart or your oxen drop it, you're not allowed to pick it up, you know? That's kind of like the story of Ruth and Boaz, if you remember that story. Um, But essentially, it was to... You know, don't go around slandering people. Don't go around doing these things to people because they're your neighbor, right? And if you think about the structure of the 10 commandments, right? It's essentially six commandments are about relationships with other people and the other four about the Lord. So within the 10, we have love God and love people, okay? So the question we have to ask ourselves is why does the Lord set up the law in such a way that it was to care for the neighbor, because your neighbor is the image of God. You don't murder people because people are the image of God. You don't steal from a man and steal his wife because your neighbor is the image and likeness of God. And so what you do to one, you do to him, okay? The question though is that the lawyer is about to ask him it is, and we'll see it in a second is, who essentially is my neighbor? Right? And we know the answer where Jesus is like anybody in need. Um, the, but the question is, how is everybody my neighbor? Yes, yes, they're the image and their likeness. But if you think about Genesis and you think about when the, the two first humans, before they sin, what does Yahweh give them the command to do? You're to rule and to reign over every beast and over every living creature, right? Then once sin is introduced in the garden, he comes and he confronts their sin. And he said, now there's going to be division between you and you'll actually seek to control each other. You'll actually seek to dominate and rule over each other. But prior to sin, women and and, and men were to rule and to reign and have authority together over the land, over everything but each other. But when sin is introduced, now God is saying, the, the, the authority you were to have over everything else will now be geared towards trying to control each other. And we see that, right? Now, when, when they received the commandments at Sinai, uh, the Israelites were able to distinguish who is my neighbor and who is not my neighbor, okay? Now, I, again, I'm, fly, I'm kind of flying through this. That's kind of the precedent for Luke 10 and the Good Samaritan. The question is, who is my neighbor? Because he wants to know who do I not have to care for? That's the real question. But when the Lord gives Moses the law at Sinai, he gives them a definition of who is their neighbor. It's the sojourner, the one that doesn't have an inheritance, the one that doesn't have land, the one that doesn't have property or flock or resources. Those are your neighbors. You're to take care of them. Also, it's your fellow Israelite. So though they were to take care of their neighbor, their neighbor was still limited. It wasn't really everybody. It was just these two groups of people. Does that make sense? Okay. So when you get to the Good Samaritan in Luke 10, which... I don't know. I mean, I feel like most of you have read this, right? So we, can we just kind of dissect it a little bit? You have this lawyer who stands up to put Jesus to the test, okay? We kind of went over it. We didn't really. But basically, he says, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, well, what does the law say? Have you never read it? You know? And he tells him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And then the lawyer responds, or sorry, the lawyer says, you shall love the Lord your God, whatever. And then Jesus responds and says, you are correct. But basically, desire, desiring to justify himself, he, he says, well, who is my neighbor? And Jesus answers his question with the story of a man who went down from Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell amongst robbers and they stripped him and they beat him half dead. And one day a priest was going by and saw him and avoided him. The next day, the Levite comes and he sees him and avoids him. But one day, a Samaritan comes. We know the story, right? And we're not gonna break down the the story of the good Samaritan, but we will hit on this a little bit. But at the end of this parable or this story, Jesus asks him, which of these three people are the neighbor? And the man doesn't even have the courage to say the Samaritan due to the cultural 
uh, ramifications. Samaritans were considered half-breeds. Um, by the Jewish, they were considered that they were not a part of the original covenant because when they split off, they became, they became exiled and they actually, you know, they started fornicating and marrying people outside of the covenant. So the Jewish people were like, they're half-breeds, they're impure, okay? So when he asks the Jewish man, who is the neighbor? He doesn't even label the man, the Samaritan. He refuses to acknowledge who it is. He just says the one who showed mercy. But Jesus is, the epitome of this parable is Jesus tells him, go and do likewise. Remember the question was, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus goes through a story and says, go and do this. The problem though, is that Jesus is essentially responding to a question of, um, how do I love my neighbor? Jesus says, by jumping over this 100 foot wall. He knows it's not possible for him. Like, it's not possible to just love your neighbor. You have to have a fundamental change of the heart. You can't just love people, right? And we've seen that within leadership. Like, it's some leaders just genuinely just don't love people. And then you have leaders that you're like, they just love people. What's the difference? The inside has been transformed, okay? So Jesus tells him, go and do likewise is not go and believe. It's not go and believe that you can love your neighbor. It's go and do it. This level of love that God beckons from you requires a cost, and that cost requires effort. Leading people requires effort. It's a lot of work. It, and, and I'm not saying it's, it's, it's bad work. It's just hard work. It's laborsome. It's tiresome. It's, it's like, you know, on Friday nights, it's, I have to be at training. I mean, this past Friday, I have to be at training, you know, at seven o'clock in the morning, got to get up, got to shave. And we're up, we're still in my living room at midnight and people are still over and I'm like, there's a cost to it, but man, we love it. It's the cost of just leading and being with people and taking care of people that you realize I'll, I'll go into the next day suffering and being tired because I'm almost 34 and I get tired now. I just know my limits, right? <laughs> so sometimes midnight hits you really hard at seven o'clock the next day. And you're like, why did we do that again this week, you know? But in the moment, it's like, this is where we want, this is our, these are our neighbors. We wanna love them well. Is this all kind of, okay, cool. All right, so Jesus says, but a new commandment I give to you. Like you've heard it said, love God, but a new commandment I give to you. In John 13, he's sitting with the disciples and he tells them, a new command I give to you. Love one another. They're like, okay, we got that. That's cool. You've been talking about that your whole ministry. Got it. As I have loved you. Okay, wait a second. That's another whole level. It's easy for me to say, Maureen, you should just love people within the capacity that you can. It's another thing to say, Maureen, God will hold you to the standard of loving people like he's loved you. It's a whole different paradigm shift. And if, if I'm honest, it, puts, it should put the fear of the Lord in every single heart of every single believer, especially a leader right? And he says, so I've loved you, you must love one another. By this, everybody will know that you're my disciples. Notice it wasn't if you have a big ministry with a good marketing strategy, they'll know that you're a disciple. It's by taking care of the one that is in front of you, you will somehow evangelize to everyone around you of whose you belong to. Does that make sense? A few things in here. We're going to kind of break this down a little bit more than the rest. So Jesus, context, he's the final week of his life. He's entered Jerusalem. They've cried out Hosanna. Um, he has performed miracles. Now he's having his final Passover meal with his disciples, okay? And he's having these conversations with them about, you know, how he's gonna have to go away and how the son of man must be lifted up, yada, yada, yada. And John actually records in John 13 that Jesus knew his final hour was approaching. He actually knew that this was coming. And you think about, I don't, let's put God aside for a second. I want you to take any well-known leader in the church, just think in your mind, any, any really well, well-known leader, and imagine that they had about 24 hours to live. And they were told, you have 24 hours to live. I mean, how would you live your last 24 hours? Most of us would probably just, I'm just gonna go away and spend time with my children, my family. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna like separate myself. I'm not gonna be accessible by people. I just need it. Or maybe some of you are like, I'm, I'm gonna swipe the Amex gold card. We're going to Italy because I gotta have gelato one more time or something, right? Jesus takes one of the final hours to serve them yet again. Like he is about to go to the cross and he's like, this is another opportunity. This is my last one. I'm just gonna serve them again, okay? 
what does he do? He washes their feet, which is an expected service of a slave, not a, not a man and not a well-educated man and not least a rabbi. A rabbi, a teacher does not wash the feet of his students. It just doesn't happen. But Jesus takes the place of a slave in his final hours to serve them just one last time. And notice that Jesus tells them, as I have loved you, you are to love others. I feel like some of the, the ways we have learned this in the church is as you have been hurt, go hurt others. Or as I have hurt you, go try and be good to others. But Jesus doesn't play on those terms of yes, you've been hurt, but it's not go hurt as people have hurt you. It's love as I have loved you. And yes, sometimes learning, we were talking about this morning over coffee, there are, there are facets and depths into the Lord that you only get to experience by way of hurt. There are people that have traveled places in God that no others get to travel because they've suffered at a level that some of us refuse to even acknowledge that God would like to, us to go there. Some of us are like, I just have a hard time with just traffic and paying my bills, God, let alone having to be hurt by people around me. Like, God forbid that ever happens, you know? And so this is a new command because it's a new standard. So when Jesus says a new command I give you, it's not necessarily a new thing. It's a new, it's another whole level, which is new. I mean, that's still, we're still trying to grasp the new command today. Hey, what should I do as a leader? Love people. Well, that, yeah, but what's new? That's the, that's the new thing. Like love people, like Jesus has loved you. Try that first and see how you do. You know? <laughs> Before you build a church, try to love people. So think about, that was the golden rule. Love others as, you know, do unto others as you would have done to you. So the golden rule is not golden enough for the Lord. The reason why it's a new standard is because in the Old Testament, it wasn't so much about loving people. Jesus' new, new level is you don't just love people, you forgive them and you serve them unto even death. So in the Old Testament, it's take care of people. But here Jesus goes the next step. He says, it's not just about taking care of people. It's about forgiving people. And you know what? It's not just about forgiving people. It's actually about laying down your life for those people. So most of us live in the Old Testament. We just wanna just, oh, we just wanna take care of people. We'll just take care of them. But we don't wanna deal with them. We just wanna provide a place for them. But when we start dealing with people, then we have a tension point. And Jesus is like, it goes beyond even dealing. It goes down to denying yourself and your title and your authority and your rights and uplifting the people around you. Philippians 2, right? Jesus undergirds to bring us up, okay? All right, is this okay? Are we, okay, this is still an introduction. <laughs> One thing I wanted to say, when I said it in my house the other night, you could see it kind of hit people. Some people were smiling, some people looked confused. Jesus is not the head of the Christian faith. He's not the head of Christianity. He's the head of a body, of people. Christianity was something that the pagans had to acknowledge. What, what is this thing, this sect, this thing? that is happening, oh, this is, these are Christians, little Christs. And that was a diss because they're like, oh, you're gonna be like your dead Messiah who's supposedly resurrected. So you are like little Christs. But the term Christian only appears two times in the New Testament. And it's usually in reference to the pagans having some sort of paradigm for this growing cult. That's what they believed it was. They believed it was a cult. So Christianity isn't what Jesus is the head of. He is the head of his body and his body is built of disciples. I need you to get this because the standard is not Christianity. The standard is Christ. Christianity would tell you love others because that's what you're supposed to do. Jesus would say, no, you love others because I have commanded you to. So in our culture, especially in DFW, like this is a, a Bible belt buckle, okay? We're doing the Christian thing because it's the Christian thing to do. And Jesus has distanced himself from the Christian thing to do. And it's like, are we gonna do the Christ thing? It's not the Christian thing, it's the Christ thing, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, because discipleship is not like Christianity. Discipleship says we give our lives for others because Jesus has done that for me. Not I tolerate and put up with you because I have to because God called you to my church. That's the Christian thing. The Christ thing is God has called you to my sheepfold and I will give my life for you. Within the Jewish ethics, the sign that actually proved a disciple had learned from their teacher or master was in their ability to imitate their teacher. So you, you actually, like, so for example, students here, right? If Pastor William was here and he was to say, you know what, Joey, these are my students. I would say, well, they have to prove it by the way they imitate you. They're not your students because they sit here and listen to you teach. 
Anybody can sit in a classroom and listen to somebody teach and not take on the nature and likeness of the teacher. But education in the Jewish world was imitation. Imitation proved that you were educated. So you would imitate your rabbi, you would imitate somebody, and that proved that you belong to that somebody. Augustine of Hippo said, I posted this a while ago uh, on, on, online. He says, Any, anyone who thinks that they've understood the scriptures but can't love God and neighbor has yet to even understand them. That would be my commission to you. You could go to Bible college and get a PhD and not know how to be like God. Like you can actually prove by getting a PhD that if you don't love people well, you actually don't understand the thing you have a doctorate in. Because Information is not imitation, okay? I wanna hit on just this, this aspect of imitation. You have to hear and do. It's hearing and doing. Be weary of those who hear and never do, okay? Also be weary of those who try to do but never listen. <laughs> That's for the leaders, okay? Uh, James talks about basically, for anybody who, who, who is not a hearer or doer, it's like he looks in the mirror, he turns away, he forgets who he once was. But the one, notice this, this is James, okay? This is the brother of Jesus. But the one who looks into the perfect law of liberty and perseveres, he is the one who hears and does. The question is, what the heck does he mean by looks into the perfect law? Well, what's the great new commandment? Love others as what? Christ has loved you. James says, anybody who looks into that perfect law and does it is like the one who hears and does. So when we think about like the perfect law and liberty, we're thinking like somebody who's like been obedient to all the commandments and law. No, 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 no. The new law is this. Love others as I have loved you. Love God and love your neighbor. So James is saying, listen, you can hear that and not do it. And you're like the man who looks in a mirror and forgets who you are. But if you adhere to what God has called you to, to loving him and loving neighbor, and you do it, notice this word, and persevere in it, that's the hard one. It's easy to just love people initially, right? You just went to habitation. Corey just preached. You're sweaty. You got merch. You go home and you tell everybody how cool it is. Day one. Day 13 comes and now perseverance is required of you. James is saying you can't just do it. You actually have to persevere through it. And if you do that, you're considered a hearer and a doer. If it's sobering, I want it to be because I want us to kind of just like check our hearts at some point, okay? All right, we're almost done, actually. This is going faster than I thought. Jesus calls you to love not only your neighbor, but your enemy. That's another whole new paradigm, right? If you think, if you think, about, if you think about the Israelites, they were to take care of the sojourner and the foreigner. Um, but Jesus comes in and says, you know what? Love Love those who are far off, forgive those who have hurt you, and love your enemy. And you're thinking, this is really hard. I mean, we were talking this morning, and Pastor Tanner was like, it just seems like, like if you just read it at face value, that Jesus is kind of contradicting the Father at some point, you know? Like, why would he come in? We were talking about, in the Old Testament, the Lord, Yahweh, meets people in their capacity, but they didn't have new hearts, so he meets them in their capacity to love people by doing what? Provide for them, give them resources, give them grain, give them food, give them shelter, provide for them. Jesus comes and says, they didn't have the heart to receive. Now you're gonna have a new heart. So we're gonna, we're gonna put it a beta 2.0. Don't just give people resources, love even the enemy next to you, okay? And you're thinking that's a hard saying. It is if you don't have the right heart. If your heart hasn't been made new, loving your enemies is really hard. But thinking about Jesus saying this and then washing Judas' feet, I'm sure you guys have heard it copious times here. Judas, Judas does it with clean feet. But I want you to notice one thing in the narrative. I'm actually gonna flip to John 13 real quick. So John 13, Jesus is giving the new commandment. This is still in the, in the, in the context of a new commandment, right? And he says, where I'm going, you can't go, all this stuff. But back in verses 10, it says that when he had washed their feet, um, Simon Peter's like, Lord, you know, I don't, I don't need you to do this. Peter and his braggadocious narcissism, right? He says, Lord, don't do this for me. And he said, if I don't do it for you, you're not mine. Which is a really, that's a really stark thing to say after this dude has been following you for about three and a half years. Peter, I know we've like had this association, but if I don't, this, don't do this, you don't belong to me anymore. And then Simon's like, just 
dip me in, dip me in all of it. Like, <laughs> just drown me in the water, Lord. Do it to my head, my hands, my feet, everywhere. And he says this, Jesus makes a statement in John 13, 10. He said, the one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet because he is clean. And you are clean, but not every one of you. It's crazy to think that he washed everybody's feet and yet Judas still wasn't clean because of his heart. Jesus is telling Peter, if I don't wash you, you actually don't belong to me. But you're thinking, wait a second, you just washed Judas's feet and he doesn't belong to you. Why? Because of Judas's choice in his heart to not be a part of the fold. And it's, it's, it is a stark warning that he, he betrayed Jesus with clean feet, but his heart was unclean. And if there's one thing to take away this, this today and tomorrow, I'm going after your heart. I'm not going after your gifting. I could care less what you're good at. Your gifting one day will cease. Like you're gonna be a nobody. We'll be forgotten about. History books probably won't be written about us. But your heart matters now. Your gifting does not really matter that much. Your gifting is unto something greater. Your character matters right now, okay? If God had shown you, think about, I want you to think about this when you think about Judas. If God was to show you the trauma that you were gonna experience at the hand of somebody else way before it ever happened, you likely would have never endured that. You probably would have been like, I'm never gonna go to that church. Like if God had showed me some of the stuff I had to walk through in seasons, I probably would never would have just like done the thing that would have led me to the hurt. The last thing I would have done was wash that person's feet. <laughs> like I'm just being honest. I don't care for feet. I think they're gross. Some people's feet are nasty. My feet are probably nasty, okay? Honestly, the last thing we would do is wash people's feet, let alone associate with them and give them access and energy to our daily life. And when people hurt you, most of you will run to everybody else for prayer, but really it's gossip. Like, did you know what so-and-so did? Like, oh, let's keep them in prayer. Hey, just be weary. Like I had this dream the other night and I just want you to be careful. No, you're hurt by the person and now you're slandering them. Jesus doesn't slander Judas. He just serves him. And then he sends him away. And I think that what, what a paradigm for us as Christians to know that you're not called to be a doormat. You're called to just be like Christ was to you, to other people. And I'll tell you this, when it comes to enemies, if you watch what you think about people, you won't have to watch what you say about them. I'm gonna close with this. How do you love an enemy? You refuse to see people as enemies. When you think about an enemy, you think about somebody who is at least equal in authority and power and influence or someone greater. But if you belong to the king, who's king of all kings, you actually don't really have any true enemies because none really have authority over you. None can really intimidate you by way of resource or strength because who are they to you? Because whose are you? So you refuse to see enemies because enemies, we see enemies as the potential to steal and rob and take. But in reality, you've been given all things in life and godliness. What can people actually take from you? And this is what Jesus is trying to get the disciples to think about. Like you love your enemy as yourself because you don't really see people as enemies anymore. Does that make sense? I wanted to hit that. So my question is, how do we know that we have succeeded in understanding God? I mean, you could sit here every Sunday and not know God. Like, it's possible. Like, you could be on staff and not know the Lord. I've seen it before. You can, you can do all of the Christian things. You can fast, you can pray, you can come get baptized every Sunday, you can take communion every Sunday and not succeed in understanding who God is. You understand God by way of imitation. Your life should show that you know who he is by the way in which you live before other people. And you know what? The people that truly know the Lord don't have to shout about it. They don't even have to broadcast it. They don't walk around by talking about themselves and all their stories. You just know when you get around people that know the Lord, you just know that they know the Lord when you get around them. You could like feel it, it's tangible. So the question is, what do we do with love your neighbor as yourself? Just like Jesus says, you just go and do likewise. Does that give context for kind of where we're going? Okay, so we're gonna go to the actual teaching now. All right, so we're gonna talk about shepherding. So I wanna read, we're gonna read John 10. I'm gonna read one through 18 and you just, just listen, okay? Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. And to him, the gatekeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name 
and leads them out. And when he's brought out all of his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee for they do not know the voice of the strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. Verse seven, so Jesus said, truly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers. I want you to remember that. Not some, all. But the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door, and if anyone enters by me, he will be saved and go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy, but I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, and he who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. And he flees because he's hired and cares nothing for the sheep. But I am the good shepherd and I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. And I have other sheep that are not of this fold. I must bring them in also and they will listen to my voice. So they will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me because I lay down my life, that I may take it up again. No one actually takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. For I have authority to lay it down, and I have authority to take it up. What a bold statement. This charge I have received from my Father, okay? So I'm gonna preface this teaching. I'm gonna, get, I'm gonna warn you now, okay? I'm gonna say things that intentionally provoke you and cause you to rethink things about you and people, what I want to do is pull out of you your paradigm that you think you have for what a pastor and leader should be. And for leaders and pastors, this is a stark warning. Okay? All right. Everybody okay with this? The reason I want to get into a biblical theology of shepherding is because we have a lot of books on leadership out there. A lot of books on leadership. You cannot have a biblical theology of leadership without a biblical Christology, a theology of who Christ is. Because whatever type of understanding, well, you may be, well, I went to a Tony Robbins, you know, exhort or whatever, that's great. But the epitome of what leadership is is found only in the person of Christ. All of these like tips and tricks to be a leader now are just so like, they're just cheap. There's cheap ways to become leaders. And there's a cheap way in the church to become a leader. Find a few people, start a church. And maybe do a conference, have merch, and like, you know, don't really lead people. Just create an organization and run and make sure that people give enough money to sustain the organization. And now you're a leader. And you can look nothing like the chief leader. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, So the reason I want to bring this up is because years ago, I'm going to invite you into my world, okay? Years and years ago, I had a group of people that, Katie being now my wife, was a part of it. We... I got kind of saved in the Orange County house church kind of movement. And my buddy, I had a buddy named Micah who was very pivotal in, in my early, you know, years of being a Christian. And he basically had this group of people that he kind of like led and shepherded. And it was a bunch of ragtag, you know, millennials who had no upbringing in the church. We got radically saved and off of drugs and all that stuff. And But I remember he was going to get ordained. I was probably saved maybe five, six months, and we did an ordination at his aunt and uncle's house. And his aunt was like the wild, prophetic, charismatic lady. And so he, we're doing an ordination, everybody's praying over him, and she just starts going off into prophecy. And then she just like looks at me, and she said, you're gonna be a pastor. And I said, I don't wanna be a pastor. Like I, I had no filter, right? I, don't, I didn't realize like you just receive the word, take it back to God, <laughs> don't say anything. I was like, I don't wanna be a pastor. In my mind, that was the most boring thing you could ever do. Pastor people, I don't even like people. Like, I just tolerate people. And, and my paradigm went to, I have to lead a group of people in one city for the rest of my life. I don't wanna do that. I don't wanna be stuck in the four walls of a church. And she just started prophesying, she's, you're called to teach and you're called to pastor and you will do this. This is what you're called to do. And I'm like, you're off your rocker. <laughs> you, know? like, you drink too much kombucha or something, whatever you do. Um, But what I didn't realize was that that was the first kind of prophetic word I ever got really about pastoring and shepherding people and teaching. The term pastor just means shepherd in Latin. So whenever you say Pastor William, Pastor Jenny, that means shepherd Jenny. 
Shepherd William, Shepherd Costi, which means that they should be functioning in the title that you're gonna give them. Okay, so let's think about shepherding. Can we just go through like a biblical time frame of shepherding, okay? One person I wanna look at is Ezekiel. Just some context for Ezekiel. Um, during Ezekiel's lifetime, Israel had been exiled into Babylon, and so he's living during, um, he's a prophet living during Babylonian captivity. And he starts writing to his people, the Israelites, like we have royally screwed up. And if we will repent, God will rescue us. But basically, during Ezekiel's life, the major prophecy that he walked in, he prophesied that one day Jerusalem's actually gonna be destroyed. It'll cease to exist, but God would actually bring his people back to himself. That God was gonna do it. The people couldn't do it. We've learned from history that people could not rescue themselves. God had to do it. Through Egypt, through Babylon, through Assyria, God over and over and over and over again had to rescue his own people. So this is shepherd language, okay? So I'm gonna jump to Ezekiel 22. You just listen to me. Just, just yeah, write it down in your little journal, whatever. Ezekiel, I'm gonna give you some backstory and then we're gonna go forward. Ezekiel 22, verses 25 through 30, okay? It says this. It says, the conspiracy, that, so Ezekiel's in the middle of a, a prophecy, ready? Son of man, say to her, you are a land that is not cleansed and not rained upon because of the day of indignation, verse 25. The conspiracy of her prophets, so God is critiquing through Ezekiel the leadership of Israel, okay? The conspiracy of her prophets in her midst is like a roaring lion tearing the prey. They have devoured human lives. They've taken treasure and precious things, and they've made many widows in her midst. Her priests have done violence to my law, and they've profaned my holy things. They have made no distinction between the holy and the common. This is what Pastor Jenny was just teaching. Neither have they taught the difference between the clean and unclean. Also, they have disregarded my Sabbath so that I am profaned among the nations. Verse 27, her princes in her midst are like wolves, tearing the prey, shedding blood, destroying lives to get dishonest gain. And her prophets have smeared whitewash for them, seeing false visions and divining lies for them saying, thus says the Lord God, when the Lord has not actually spoken. The people of the land have practiced exhortation and committed extortion, sorry, not exhortation. The people have practiced extortion and committed robbery. They've oppressed the poor and the needy and they've extorted from the sojourner without justice. Behold, I sought for a man among them who would build up the wall and stand in the breach before me in the land. That's shepherd language. That's a wall that protects the flock. Behold, I sought a man to build a wall and stand in the breach for me that I would not destroy it, but I couldn't find one. Verse 31, therefore I have poured out my indignation upon them. Notice not everybody, them. I have consumed them with the fire of my wrath and I have returned their way upon their heads, declares Yahweh. Okay, so... When Ezekiel prophesies against the current state of affairs, but then also prophesies a day of hope, in context, the era of hope and of peace and of security and of blessing that we'll see in a little bit has to do with a change in Israel's leadership. It's not all of Israel coming into repentance. Ezekiel specifically says that God will actually bring a piece of blessing and hope and we'll be able to like sheep eat from, we'll graze the hill of the Lord when God removes the poor leaders among them, okay? Why? Because for Israel's leaders, they assumed that their power was a privilege instead of a responsibility. There are so many people in church today that are in leadership that assume that their power and authority is the gift and privilege of God. No, 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 it is the responsibility that you owe to God for having power and authority. All authority has been given to him, so he's just given it away to you. But you are responsible for the authority which God has entrusted you to. It is not a privilege, it's a responsibility, okay? So we don't flaunt it and walk around with it. We actually should carry and tremble with fear by the fact that he's given us an aspect of him to steward for him. And one day we will answer to him for it. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So this era that he's talking about, when he says, like, I've, I've consumed them with my wrath, but, but I'm going to one day come back and rescue them, okay? This is found, I'm going to go a little bit further back. This is found in 
Now, I want you to notice something. Whenever you're reading prophetic literature, whether it's Old Testament or New Testament, timelines are hard to follow, okay? So you're like reading something in chapter 20 that looks like it's gonna happen after chapter 22, and then chapter 34 comes and it looks like it's happening before all of it. Just be careful with timelines, okay? It's very hard, it's like revelation. Like, there's not a timeline because it's prophetic literature. It's outside of time, okay? So it's hard to adequately kind of convey, all right? But in Ezekiel 20, I'm gonna read this really quickly. Ezekiel talks about one day the Lord's gonna restore us, okay? And he goes on to say this in in verse 33 of Ezekiel 20. As I live, declares the Lord, surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath, so we see the same language, poured out, I will be a king over you. So notice back in chapter 22, he said that because there was no healthy leader to stand in the gap and build the wall to protect the people, he was gonna pour out his wrath against them. Against who? Against the people that would not step up and help the sheep, okay? So now Ezekiel, though this is before chapter 22, Ezekiel saying once the wrath has been poured out, God's gonna rescue them, okay? Does that make sense? I'm kind of giving you a timeline because when we think about God pouring out wrath, we're like, what time in history is this? This is him cleansing Israel from poor shepherds, from bad shepherds and leaders and prophets. It says this, I, and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. Verse 34, and I will bring you out from the peoples and I will gather you out of the countries where you're scattered and with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with the wrath poured out. Verse 35, I will bring you into the wilderness of peoples and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face, okay? So this is, a, this is a prophecy of exile, okay? And as I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod and I will bring you into the bond of covenant. I will purge out the rebel from among you and those who transgress against me. And I'll bring them out of the land where they sojourn but they will never enter the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord, okay? So there's a lot of things happening here. Ezekiel, if you've read Isaiah or Jeremiah, Ezekiel, like these two major prophets, understands that the exodus of Israel being rescued out of Egypt is much more than just history. Ezekiel's saying it's gonna happen again. Just like he rescued you out of Egypt, God's gonna one day come and rescue you again, okay? And if you think about the book of Revelation, it's the removal of everything that's an obstacle of him coming to rescue us once and for all. So we see what starts early in the Torah continues and continues and continues till Jesus comes and defeats every enemy by way of wrath to do what? To bring us to him because we'll be his people, where? In his land, We will be his sheep that can just graze forever without fear of the wolf or the enemy. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, So for Ezekiel, this is much more than history. It's history is about to be repeated, okay? And it's a paradigm for how we see God constantly working amongst people. Um, It says that God will gather them out of bondage and allow them to pass under the rod and go into the bond of covenant Rod, that is a shepherd tool. So he's saying, I'm gonna, I'm gonna allow you to pass under the rod. Now, what does that mean? Well, whenever a shepherd would bring sheep home, he would open the gate and he would bring them under the rod. What does that mean? He would count them, which means he knows every single one. They pass under the rod. He would use the rod to count one, two. You know how sometimes it just helps using your finger? One, two, three. So a shepherd would use a rod to pinpoint one, two, three, to make sure he has all of them. Okay, so when, when he's telling them, remember, they're living in exile to Babylon, like the most evil city in all of, you know, biblical history, Babylon, he's telling them, one day I'm gonna bring you home to me and I'm gonna count each one of you. And why am I gonna count each one of you? Because it's the bond of covenant, Ezekiel says. The covenant is that I, because I won't lose either one of you. I'm gonna get all of you back, Okay. So God will one day, Ezekiel says, lead people back home like a shepherd. Ezekiel ends, if you think about Ezekiel, like the, the way the narrator and the, and the, and the author like kind of compiles this story, it's actually like a new Moses type, thinking about Moses. Well, what, what did Moses do? 
Well, he got a new people with new laws going into a new land, okay? So Ezekiel ends his prophecy in this book with, one day there's gonna be these new rules and paradigms in which Israel gets to live by under this new ruler who is God himself in a brand new land without a temple. So he's kind of like a Moses figure. He's, he's commissioning and charging a generation to like, I know it's bad now, but there's a day coming where God's gonna rescue us. So that's it, right? That's all we have to say about Ezekiel, right? No, <laughs> like, no, because what Ezekiel wants to do is he doesn't wanna just give them hope. He also wants to confront those bad leaders. And he does so in chapter 34. And that's kind of where we're gonna spend some time in today, okay? So when you think about the shepherds of Israel um, and you think about the way this book is constructed, chapters one through 24, kind of or- they kind of operate uh, as a depiction of the destruction of Judah and Jerusalem, okay? So chapter, I want you to think of this. Chapters one through 24 are sort of this like chapter, this whole, I mean, because there wasn't chapters, okay? So chapter one through 24 is all about sort of judgment and destruction and exile. And then you get to chapter 33 and chapter 33 of the book of Ezekiel is like a hinge on a door, the whole door hinges on 33, okay? And, it, and it's the whole hinge is now the whole book moves to hope. So what was once destruction, now Ezekiel's gonna prophesy hope and it hinges, okay? And Ezekiel's pointing to a new era. Chapters 34 through 48 are the description of what that era is going to be like. So if you're just to write down, just to break it down, okay? But chapter 34 specifically is Ezekiel's most theological um, theologically developed idea of what leadership is truly like. And I know sometimes we think like, this is just Old Testament, Joey. Like, why do you talk about the Old Testament so much? Because the more you understand how even the early church borrowed and, and referenced and revisited the Old Testament, you would have to understand nothing under the sun is really new. We've all been here before. Our ancestors have been here before. And there's, there's, there's things we can learn from them if we'll just stop, slow down, and revisit. So this chapter, chapter 34, is something for us to revisit. But you'll notice that it's very, very prevalent even today, okay? And it's very easy for us to say, yeah, I know who he's talking about. He's talking about a bad leader. I might be talking to you five years from now. You might remember this five years from now when you have a church, so I'm talking to you now in the future you, okay? All right, because sometimes we always play the hero in parables. We never want to be the villain. You, you want to be David, but you don't want to be David with Bathsheba, right? Like you want to be Elijah, but you don't want to be the one that runs away with anxiety and fear. So Ezekiel 34, we're going to exegete this whole chapter. Are you cool with that? Do you know what that means, exegete? We're going to look at this in context. Not, we're not going to look at this by way of like how I feel about it morally, The text can never mean what it never meant. So you don't get to apply meaning to something it never meant to its original audience. You have to revisit the original context and then journey back to modern times and say, what are we bringing with us in this? What does this mean to me? Because if you don't have context, then it's a pretext for whatever the heck you want it to mean. It's like being a centimeter off and two years from now, your theology is two miles off because you were off in the beginning. I promise you the safest place you can be is understand the historical context, the cultural context. Think about the timeline. Think about that. And then bring it into your modern lens and say, because I know the truth, now I can actually filter how this is applicable, okay? Because if not, then you're just going to be Jeremiah every day when life gets hard. Well, he's promised me a future and a new hope, man. Like, I'm just believing for the future and a new hope. Like, the hope is that he's inside of you. You're living in the future hope that he prophesied about, and now you're trying to revisit him, trying to look forward. Like, stop it, you know? But we do that, and we get tattoos of it. And if you have it, that's fine. You could still get it removed. There's time, you know? No, but I, I'm joking, but I'm not. Because nothing frustrates me more when people try to shortcut around context to try to apply meaning and application. Let's break it down. One through six, Ezekiel 34. The word of the Lord came to me and said, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, thus says the Lord God, ah, shepherds of Israel who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed sheep? You eat the fat and you clothe yourselves with the wool. You slaughter the fat ones, but you don't feed the sheep. 
The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the strayed you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. Verse five, so they were scattered because there was no shepherd and they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep, notice that, my, now it's proprietary. My sheep were scattered. They wandered all over the mountains and on every high hill, My sheep were scattered over the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. This brings us back to what we just read about Ezekiel looking for, the Lord said, I look for a man that would build a place of safety and nobody did it. So I'll pour wrath on all the people that falsely led them. So now Ezekiel's gonna break down that that subtle statement he made back in chapter, chapter 20, okay? This is an indictment. You know what an indictment is? A charge has been brought against you. You know, you're being charged with the murder of so-and-so. God, when, if God brings an indictment to a person, pay attention in scripture. And you'll notice most time it has to do with their character and their heart. It's not so much about how they did it. The problem is, is that they're just terrible human beings because of the heart. Because you'll notice one thing. You have Herod, who sets his heart against God, murders Christians to try to control it. And Paul, who sets his heart on God, murders Christians to try to control it. And two of them have two different destinies. Why? Because of the heart. Paul had the right heart with the wrong method and wrong application. And God's like, I can work with it because he has the right heart. I just need to change his paradigm and he'll change his application. Does that make sense? Okay, cool. So this is an indictment. It's also ironic that the sheep are being abused by those who have been charged to take care of them. I mean, how many documentaries do we have about you know, the fall of Hillsong, the fall of this, the fall of that, where poor shepherds come in by way of skill and they end up consuming off the people they're called to give life to. It's a stark warning. Like, I want you to just, as we're just thinking, think, God, keep me from that. Never think like, oh, God, forgive those people. No, 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 God, guard my heart from this. Because I'll tell you what, it's easy to say I'll never be like that, but I know from experience, when you get a place of authority or a title or a role or influence, it's very easy to subtly slip into this. See, everybody's a good spouse when they're not married. Everybody's the perfect parent when you never had a kid. Everybody's the perfect leader when they're not leading anybody. Then God gives you people and you subtly start to see this stuff come up. So keep your heart guarded, okay? So in antiquity, that's a fancy word for in the ancient times, uh, hired shepherds were expected to be self-sacrificial, okay? They were expected by the way that they worked to pay careful attention to sheep, even if they're hired. That's your expectation, okay? Shepherds weren't expected simply to tend to a flock. They were to serve the flock. I'll say this for future leaders. Your role is not to just tend to people. Your role is to serve people. Serving is not tolerating. It's so easy to just tolerate. Just get the day done, man. Get them back in the sheepfold. Gosh, work was hard today. How'd your your meeting go, Josh? Well, Well, you don't wanna know who I met with today. But that's how we act. Like, gosh, that person is exhausting. You know, gosh, why can't they just get it? No, 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 no. You don't take care of the flock. You serve the flock, okay? And that was expected of people in antiquity that were shepherds. However, these shepherds are actively consuming the flock. They wear the wool, they eat the fat, okay? They're consuming. So they are no longer like shepherds. They are like wolves, okay? How do you tell the difference between a wolf in a sheep's clothing and a sheep? by what they consume. A sheep will graze on grass, a wolf will consume every living thing around it that it can. That's how you tell the difference, by what people consume, okay? So we're always like, oh, he's a fall, he's a, sh- a wolf in sheep's clothing. Yes, if he consumes people, he is definitely a wolf in sheep's clothing, okay? The shepherds who were to care for the sheep have now taken the role of the wolf who consumes the sheep. Um, we're gonna get into some Hebrew today. Are you guys cool with that, okay? Um, the word for harshness, which I believe is in, um, is it verse four? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It is, it's called perech. And it's the only, actually, it's the only time we ever see perech ever used in the Old Testament is how Pharaoh led Egypt. It's used about eight to 10 times in the Old Testament outside of this specific verse about these bad shepherds were leading the sheep with harshness. The other the, all the other times it's used is to describe how Pharaoh led people and Israel. So God is saying the people that were care to take care of you 
have become like Pharaoh. The final words, my sheep were scattered with none to search or to seek for them is a sober ending for readers because it's a very unexpected climax. The reader of this scroll would have said, oh, you know, bad leaders and, and sheep and, you know, there's bad leaders and, 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 they, and yeah, yeah, there's bad leaders and they don't take care of people. But the whole narrative is flipped on its head when God now takes ownership and said, they did it to my people. So the unexpected climax, though, is at the end of verse six, okay, where it says, my sheep were scattered and nobody was to seek or to search for them, which means here's the unexpected climax. God will do the job for them. God's actually gonna come and do it for them because they can't do it for themselves, okay? Let me go through, is this, is this helping some context? Okay, verse seven. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, declares the Lord, Surely, because my sheep have become prey and because my sheep have become food for all the wild beasts, since there was no shepherd and because my shepherds have not searched for my sheep, but because the shepherds have fed themselves and have not fed my sheep, therefore, you shepherds hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, behold, I am against you and I will require my sheep at your hand and I will put a stop to their feeding the sheep. No longer shall the shepherds feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths that they may not be food for them. In order to rescue his own sheep from self-serving shepherds, he always says, I'm gonna remove them from their office and let them suffer. In antiquity, you know, agrarian societies, Shepherding is huge to have livestock. I mean, this is your livelihood. When we think about like, for example, tithes and offerings, for example, the tithe wasn't about money. It was about livestock and grain and oil. It was the natural resources that you would have, right? So the idea of if I can't do the basics right, that was shameful to be excommunicated from your job. So he puts them away, which would have been shameful and disgraceful, right? But the intention is to, if you as we go on verses 11 through 16, right? So he's telling them, this is what you're not doing. So I'm going to remove you. I'm gonna rescue them. And then verses 11 through 16 are the complete reversal of everything that they did wrong. So now the Lord says, I'm gonna reverse everything that was done wrong to my sheep, okay? You'll notice this theme in six verses or seven, I will appears more than 10 times. I will, I will, I will. Not I'm contemplating, I will, okay? When God says I will, trust that he will. Okay. Verse 11 says this, for thus says the Lord God, behold, I myself will search out for my sheep and will seek them out. As a shepherd seeks out his flock when he is among the sheep and have been scattered, so I will seek out my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on days of clouds and thick darkness. And I will bring them out from the peoples and gather them from the countries and I'll bring them into their own land. And I'll feed them on the mountains of Israel by the ravines and in the inhabited places of the country. And I will feed them on good, with good pasture. And on the mountain heights of Israel shall be their grazing land. There they shall lie down in good grazing land and on rich pasture they shall feed on the mountains of Israel. And I myself will be the shepherd of my sheep. And I myself will make them lie down, declares the Lord God. Verse 16, I will seek the lost and I will bring back the strayed. I will bind up the injured and I will strengthen the weak and the fat and the strong I will destroy and I will feed them in justice. Interesting that they were consuming sheep by way of injustice. So now God says, I'm gonna bring justice by feeding you justice, which is, you don't wanna be fed by that. That's not a good thing, right? So what we see here is that the weak are not strengthened so God's gonna strengthen them. They are not, the sick aren't healed, so God's gonna heal them. The injured aren't bound up, so God's gonna bound them up. The strayed are not brought back, so God's gonna go and get them. The lost are not sought out, so God will go find them. And they're ruled with harshness, so Yahweh's actually gonna be lowly and gentle. That should immediately bring you to when Jesus says, all you who are weary and heavy laden, come to me, I'll give you rest. Why? Because you're under the lordship of people that are putting awful burdens on you, which they themselves can't even carry. But I am gentle and lowly in heart, right? This, this 11 through 16 is actually a direct 
prophecy of what Jeremiah actually says in Jeremiah 23. So Ezekiel actually borrows a lot of his prophecy from Jeremiah, which you're thinking, like, does that make it true? Did he see it? Yeah, it makes it true because God gave it to Jeremiah too. Like, so he borrows a lot from Jeremiah and Isaiah, but mostly from Jeremiah, okay? So if you wanna make a note, you could just say Jeremiah 23. Um, okay, how are we doing? Do we need to take a break? 